after spending about a week in the southern Arizona area, Tempe and Tucson, we're finally getting out of here. We're heading towards Globe. Now there's a threat of rain tomorrow. It's the first day back in the saddle, and uh, we've got two days of uh, threatening rain that could uh, put a delay in our arrival to see the Apache tribe in uh, San Carlos, Arizona. That's our next major stop. That is the storm that is coming to ring us out for two days. Do you think we can make it to Globe? I think we can make it to Key West. afternoon set in when we arrived in Superior, Arizona. We scrapped that globe destination in order to brace for the storm that was coming in right behind us. I don't know if you've ever seen the movie U-Turn, but this town is known for people getting stuck and never being able to leave. The people at the motel desk said it was a death wish to leave on bicycles in the rain because local weather reports warned of major rock slides. With all this water rushing off the mountain peaks, the roads would be suicide. If we don't ride for two days, we miss our opportunity to meet with the Apache tribe. The good news is that we only need to cover about 50 miles on the bikes to make it to the reservation. The question is, how long will this rain hold up? Lucky for us, the rain is letting up on the morning of our second day off. The storm is just barely ahead of us. Seeing all this blue sky behind the storm, we felt comfortable to ride. Nothing really compares to riding uphill through a beautiful desert setting while the place is still draining. Who cares if you're completely winded from all this uphill? How many times do you get to see waterfalls form in this setting or raging rapids forming along the side of the road? We've almost made it to San Carlos, Arizona, home of the 10th largest Indian reservation in the United States. There's something about a Native American perspective that is key to all of this. So we're gonna stop here and see what kind of environmental perspective we can collect. Our friend Mono took us on a tour of the Apache Tribe Reservation. Mono, the director of tourism on the res, let us know that because the land on the res is so pristine, it drives a large portion of their eco-tourism. People near and far come here to experience the natural world almost completely untouched by the hands of man. The reservation boasts 1.8 million acres that span over three different land types, the lowland desert, the grassy plains, and the highland ponderosas. The lakes are teeming with fish and their forests provide hunters a chance to go after world-class elk. Right here? Right here. It came to me. Do you hear it? That. Can you hear it? Quiet. No semi-trucks ripping by in high gear. No jackhammers, no alarms going off. It was right here that I had an epiphany, if you will. Mike and I have been outside for nearly one month on this cross-country ride. But there was something very different about this moment right here. I was outdoors, not outside, outdoors, removed. It was here where I realized the difference. 
I think the one thing that's really important is why we're put here on this earth. Uh, we all are supposed to coexist together, meaning people and meaning in Apache, we, we call the earth Nagosan. Nagosan means the mother is the giver of life. So not only, not only do we look at the human beings, but you look at everything else within the earth that is reproduced and we coincide together. And, and that's basically the, the, the strong foundation of life and future. But if we get away from that, then we lose everything that's important we lose the identity of why we're here, you know, not, not just speaking for Native people, but all the people in this world. And, and, and that's what we're trying to do now is to make sure that we sustain uh, the identity because the identity is the culture and the spirit and the religion of the people. Spirituality, I think the younger generation don't have it. Older people still have it, like people my age, the people that were born in the, in the late 40s, early 50s. I think with the assimilation of Native Americans into this Western world, I said it has really, uh, you have to look at it at a percentage now today. You know, we don't have 100% moving in that, in that belief, in that, that civilization that we had of the principles. Now today, you know, there's a certain percentage out there that families are brought into, their, their children are brought into it. And, and the way it's brought into is that when a child is born, uh, the family gives a feather and stone to the child, which, is, which makes the child rooted to the earth. So as they start to grow, they have the responsibility of what the earth is all about uh, from all the life that it gives. But in the Western world, they don't teach you that. You know, the, the society that we live in today, you know, bypasses that and makes you learn that the trees, the water, the wind, the dirt, the rock doesn't have any meaning, you know, is to serve at your purpose or at your will, which is a far different teaching than what our people uh, one time uh, understood the world. But now today, you know, what, what I'm working on really hard for our children is not to see the reservation boundaries, not, not to allow that to be a uh, a prison to us. So we make this journey 126 miles yearly and I take the kids back to the ancestral homeland. And one of the important things we do is that we make them run and uh, all this way and, and, and they camp and they unify together, sharing and feeling the outdoor, knowing that the trees are life, the, the kos, which is the clouds, is life water, the need of water and the respect for water, and, and seeing the animals as the animals watch them go by. Uh, that's really important because that's the religion and the culture of the people. All the Apache people here don't go after it. It's money. If they have money, they'll pay somebody. They'll pay somebody to, to grind their acorn. They'll pay somebody to have barbecue corn. We were farmers when, when the government first started here. They taught us how to farm and raise cattle. But now we don't even have that much cattle around. We don't even have farming areas. Housing is built. We're not living off the land like the way we were living then. So we have structured places that we can't go into. You can't really change a whole lot of people today, but you can go back to the younger ones and, and start really educating there so that in the next 15 years, you have a new group of, 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 of people that care, that, that will follow what you say and what you believe. That's why I was saying earlier that if, if you look at all the things I do, I go back to their children because the old people are set in their ways. The people my age and older, they have to come to terms that, that uh, what they were told wasn't right. And sometimes they don't want to let that go. And then the ones below me are still find, trying to find their way, and they got all these different options. And the main background of a family are the grandparents, who are culturally, traditionally, and spiritually brought up that way, and raised that way, very strict. But you know, when I, when I look at it at a, at a bigger picture, you know, that's the same way with America. You know, it, if, if they can go back and retouch 
the young ones, then you can have a new crop of uh, Americans. But if you keep going the way you're going, you, you know, it may get worse. Because I, 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 and I'm just an assumption that I think a lot of people don't carry their religion the way they should carry. You know, I, I just, you know, just by, by the simple thing as water is not important, pollute it. The air is not important, pollute it. The tree is not important, cut it. Um, this animal doesn't need to be here anymore. Move it, kill it, you know. I think just that example shows you uh, where we're headed. And, and that's what's scary. The Apaches once lived in environmental balance before the Western world arrived. History informs us of their tragic past when an entire way of life was robbed from them. Obviously, they're still recuperating, trying to find a common ground between the ancestral harmony they shared with the land and our modern life encroaching for its stake of the action. It's a tough situation to be in, a spiritual and cultural past pit against a current world that seems to run on nothing less than a dollar. And in the end, I guess it all depends on what's more important to them, what they're willing to fight for. After all, any change requires some level of challenge it's a challenge in today's world to slow down long enough to remember to give back. It's a challenge to think for a moment that before we take one more thing from this planet to please ourselves, that we should give thanks for that last breath we just took. The word challenge is typically associated with hard work. Something is called a challenge because if it were easy, everybody would do it. Can you see that hill behind us? Yeah, that's what today is all about. Well, at least, uh, I don't know, probably about half. Half today is about an uphill. I still got that in front of me. Gotta get over this. Then we should have a sweet downhill and be done for the day. When it comes to our home, planet Earth, we face many challenges. In order for us to meet these challenges, it's going to take a can-do attitude. We're going to have to tell ourselves, I can make a difference. I am the problem, and I am the solution. three-way well I think it was called three-way and we only have about 20 miles to go to the state line in New Mexico the problem is is that this is the steepest uphill we've seen in uh, the entire month we've been biking I have no idea where Mike is he might have gotten a flat but on a day like today I can't go back. If he doesn't call me on the walkie, let me know what's going on. I hope he's all right. Mike and I have arrived at the most challenging point of our cross-country ride. We will take several days to climb to 6,000 feet, drop back down to 4,000 feet, and then rise up again to an elevation over 8,000 feet. The challenge that we put in front of ourselves right now is pretty frightening. Both of us are suffering from chronic aching and pain in our knees. The weight on the trailers has taken its toll on our kneecaps, and we're not even halfway across the country yet. Now, we're about to rub those kneecaps right off in climbing to 8,000 feet and pulling 75 pounds of weight behind us. So we're uh, uh, just about at 6,200 feet. We just got here. I just got here. I'm waiting for Mike. Look at my face. It's windchapped, it's burned, it's sunburned. It's kind of just all around beat. Uh, but anyway, the good news is we're about to run into Zane and company, probably in about 10, 15 miles, which is good. It'd be good to have some uh, some doctors around, you know, because uh, 
people get hurt riding bikes, you know. They never, they never tell you that, but people do. They really do. Might be a 600 foot range on the walkie. I oh, don't know, that guy drove by? Yeah. Tell me you're waiting for me. And I called and there was nothing. What happened to you? I'm just hanging out. Just hanging out. You're just hanging out? Early on, before we left on the ride, Mike and I decided it would be a good idea to have lots of miniature goals. Obviously, our major goal was to make it to Key West, but if you think about all the pain running through your body as you're climbing 6,000 feet in Arizona, Key West seems a long way off. From the start, we made it a goal to arrive at the border of New Mexico by February 1st, exactly one month into the ride. Look at that, the date on my watch says February 1st, 2008. And that right there is the New Mexico border. We did it. No way! Is it them? We have to know. <laughs> uh, Look who it is! <laughs> Just past the border was where Zane and his friend James would meet us. Gentlemen, hey! <laughs> we used the remaining hours of daylight to squeeze in a couple more miles for the day, and then it was time to set up camp and build a fire, because it's gonna be freezing here tonight. Oh yeah, we're, we're golden, dude. How are we gonna put this thing up? There's a little bit of wild turkey left in a while. The wild turkey started it, I think it below half. comes in to yeah. physical therapy. Yeah, actually. Well, no, I try to incorporate trash into my concept of wilderness now. <laughs> yeah. The plastic bottles. Otherwise, <laughs> it's, you know, it's disillusioning. Mm -hmm. how, so, so, I, how do you do that? I don't, well, it's just, I, I think about it as kind of like man's organic, you know, like the spider spins silk, man spins, you know, polypropylene. <laughs> that's our, that's our silk. It's what, it's what we put out. So in a way, it is kind of organic. Uh, you know, I try and twist it around. To, to Sounds like you spin too. <clears throat> spin, of course, yeah. Spin. That's how we train for this event, man. <laughs> Just kind of spinning things. <laughs> Doing spin moves. control, I guess. Circles. All right, we've been injected with lidocaine. Are now completely wrung out. The only thing that's left is an 8,200-foot peak to cross. <laughs> Unless, Mama Nature tells you otherwise. This storm showing up means that Zane and James won't be able to face the same challenge Mike and I have before us. Due to their work schedules, they'll be leaving us and unable to brave the 8,000 foot peak. We'll be crossing these 8,200 feet, also known as the Emery Pass, with a fresh layer of freeze on the roads. I suppose it's just as good a day as any for a challenge. Challenger! For the cross-country route that defines the Southern Tier Bicycle Ride, this 8,000-foot climb marks the highest elevation point for the entire ride. Some folks do this ride in the summer sweltering heat. We get to clear it with two pairs of socks, 
a beanie, ninja mask, and gloves. When it's 28 degrees out, your body's worst enemy is its sweat. In time, the sweat locks in and begins to chill your entire body. My feet feel frozen up to my shins, and from my palms to my elbow is the deadest sensation. It's cold up here. It's real cold. Passing 8,000 feet, 8,200 feet. You find out what cold's like. You find out what it's like to have ice cubes for feet, rather ice blocks for feet. Needless to say, riding conditions have become a bit dangerous, and I'm starting to lose control. I, I feel like I'm starting to lose control of my b b breathing. <sighs> I'm approaching the peak, and my hands are, are so cold that I can't I can't squeeze the brakes to, to slow down. How how is this downhill gonna work if my hands can't break? Why can't I get control of my breathing? The sun is setting behind the mountains, so that means the downhill is in the shade. I've never had hypothermia before. But I bet what I'm feeling right now are the early stages of it. I'm dreaming of a place where I can warm up my feet and my brain at the same time. Nestled in the heels of the Gila National Forest is a place known as the Black Range Lodge. Hi, I'm Catherine Wanick, and this is the Black Range Lodge. I moved here over 20 years ago from Los Angeles, and we run this place now as a bed and breakfast and also as a center for natural building. We became kind of experts in straw bale construction over the years, having built our own straw bale greenhouse, and now we have a guest house, a chicken coop, and a bunch of other things built out of straw here. If people just walk in the door here, one of the first things they see is our display of books and videos on natural building. And uh, we do that on purpose because we want to encourage people, if they're staying here overnight, they can pick up a book, they can take it to their room, they can watch a video. Hopefully, they can pick up a little bit of information uh, that might change their perspective just a little bit about the planet that we live on. Uh, we compost any food scraps, and these go to our chickens here in the yellow bucket. And then um, anything in this blue bucket is like coffee, tea. These go on our acid-loving plants like the bamboo and the fruit trees. And then uh, this is the paper bucket and citrus goes here. Chickens don't like citrus, but this all will compost very well and we'll put that down on the plants later. So this is our straw bale guest house. It's actually very popular with our guests. They like to come here to, for a special occasion because it's really rather luxurious inside. And uh, in fact, a lot of people do come just to see what a straw bale house looks like. Frankly, it doesn't look much different than any other house on the outside, but on the inside of the walls, you'll find big, soft, pillowy straw bales that create a really super insulated envelope and an energy efficient house. The most important rule when building a straw bale home, build the walls out of a vapor permeable plaster, like a cement line or clay. If you do it right, your straw bale home could still be standing in 100 years. So anytime you're harvesting wheat, rice, oats, barley, rye, and so forth, you end up with this stalk, this hollow stalk that's uh, really trash to the farmer. In many places they burn it. And, uh, but of course that causes a lot of air pollution. So instead of burning it, if you bale it, and then you stack those bales into the walls of your house, what you end up with is a super insulated, energy-saving wall system but one of the most important things about straw bale is the community building aspect of it. So many houses were built by the owner builders or, and or their family and friends. And plenty of times people have wall raising workshops or just parties where they invite family, friends, neighbors, even strangers. And everybody gets to a chance to build with bales and stack the giant bricks. It's pretty easy and it's uh, uh, and it's actually really fun. There is one other very important point made about their creation. 
that builds relationships and builds community. And in this world where so many people are estranged from each other, we're living in urban situations where our interaction is all about commerce, this is one of those things that has a really special memory for every single homeowner that ever builds a house like this. Capitalism doesn't work. It just seems to work. As long as you can screw somebody, exploit someone or something, capitalism will never work until we it's totally regulated. Otherwise, it's just piracy. And uh, of course, when pirates are loose, they do whatever they need to do to make a lot more money. And uh, that's one of the reasons the world is going to hell. So a straw bale house isn't really that different from any other house. You just have to build it correctly for your climate and to uh, the materials that you're using. And the old English adage uh, is true today. Give her a good hat, a good pair of boots, and a coat that breathes, and she'll last forever. That means a good roof, a good foundation, and then also a vapor permeable uh, plaster so that moisture can move in and out without doing any damage. And if you do that, you will have a long-lasting house. I wouldn't say going to hell, it's just going to change rapidly in, in your lifetime for sure. If I live to be a real old man, it might happen for me. But uh, it's going to change. It's changing, you know. We just had a major flood up there for nothing. Two inches of rain and a lot of ice and, and snow melt. And it was awesome. It really was. Uh, normally that wouldn't be happening. There'd be snow up there, and then it would war it would warm up slowly, you know. But we're having it's the weather's out of whack. There's no doubt in my mind. This was not the first time I'd heard real life perspective like this. Now, if it snows on Long Island, that in three days, pretty much the snow is gone, and we get more rain than we do snow. And I worked on the highway for uh, 28 and a half years, so I know the difference. So if you're if you're not sitting on the mountaintop, some you're 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 part of the problem. And anything you do that uh, takes you away from that is to the planet's advantage and probably to yours in the long run, though it may not seem like it all the time. You know, if you give up all the crap that you could have. here but uh, really us the mountain lions and the mouse inside of my wheel right now see look at it's like all right here I think this whole part is pinched because this part is like I'm Pat Taylor and we're in La Mesilla, New Mexico. And what we're going to do is talk a little bit about adobe and, and about the history, what makes a good adobe. What I'd like to do is uh, I like to recycle a lot. And in this day and age, that's really important. So whenever I see a pile of dirt someplace, I think, boy, that'd make some nice adobes. So I can never uh, let that pile of dirt end up in a trash fill or something. I always go by and check it out. And uh, when we do that, we do what we do, a shake test to be able to determine the composition of the dirt to see if it has enough of the sand and have, has enough of the clay. 60 to 80 percent sand and, and um, 20 to 40 percent clay. Of course, adobe homes don't just build themselves. The process to build adobe is not that complicated, and in fact, it's pretty simple once you know you have the correct ratio of sand to clay. Soak a wooden frame in water for about 20 minutes. This is important because this ensures that the wood will not stick to the adobe mix when you pull it from the frame later on. If your consistency's right, your adobe will stand. Looks like we got our consistency right. Take the dirt that's been identified as having the correct sand and clay ratio, evenly mix it with water until the dirt is heavily saturated. 
And oh look, it's straw showing up in another eco-friendly building material. And you don't want to cut your straw, but you just kind of want to break it up, evenly distribute it so you don't have clumps in there, so it's evenly mixed. Straw adds strength and integrity to the adobe block. Pour your mix into the frame. Put it right there for the next one. This is an adobe that we, we just made, and it's been two days drying, and we're ready to stand it up. You essentially pick it up and set it just like that. That's and enough. voila, the first brick to building an environmentally friendly house. For the most part, there are virtually no greenhouse gases created during the construction of an adobe home. Adobe homes can last for hundreds of years if, like anything else, they are maintained. And just like a straw bale home, adobe homes are super insulators. In the morning, the air is cool from the night before. The sun is progressively warming the house throughout the day. That warmth carries into the cooler night. The cycle repeats. This creates a home that requires very little energy to heat and cool. My name's Julie Fitzsimmons. I'm living here in this wonderful place of Las Cruces, New Mexico, and we're in the El Patio Bar in Old Mesilla. We are such a destructive species. It's man-made. We're selfish. We're selfish. We're selfish. We we don't think about what we we're using and destroying. We throw away society. Because we can't stop trying to acquire more crap people on the top, all the elites, the Tories. Riding through New Mexico, we've learned a little about some eco-friendly approaches to building a house. And if it wasn't for Dr. Zane injecting our knees in this state, we might never see Key West. Putting that much stress in your joints considerably for that long of a time um, is uh, somewhat, not dangerous, but it can be hurtful. And I, I don't think, that I wouldn't recommend doing that over, say, a year or six months, it's, I mean, obviously you'll be hurting yourself. Texas, a state with such an abundance of natural resources, it literally could live up to its slogan as the Lone Star State without importing anything from the rest of the country. We don't need the United States. We have our own oil, we have our own farms, cattle, whatever. This is a self-sufficient country. Whether you realize it or not, these jackasses after the Civil War annex us into this nation, which my forefathers and I myself are not a part of. I am a Texan, and a Texas is the Lone Star State. We have nothing to do with the United States as far as I'm concerned. I am a military, ex-military man. I fought for Texas. I didn't give a damn about the United States. As the crow flies across Texas, we could follow Interstate 10 for a near 1,400 mile ride. But since this is Project Southern Tier, our plan for Texas is to follow the U.S.-Mexican border to the bottom of the state and then follow up the Gulf of Mexico into Louisiana. For now, we're going to take a deep breath in El Paso and get a bird's eye view on air quality. That should be easy to do because 2008 marks the first year that El Paso has met the air quality standards set by the Environmental Protection Agency. For 40 years, Jesus Reynoso's life has been dedicated to cleaning up the air quality in El Paso, Texas, where he worked for the city and county health and environmental district. We are now in attainment for the three pollutants that we failed to meet uh, for the last uh, 40 years carbon monoxide, ozone, and particulate matter. Health and environment could not be highlighted more in El Paso, with its neighboring border city of Juarez together creating one of the world's largest international urban centers. Bob Curry grew up, went to college, and entered the Army in El Paso, Texas. And when I was done with the Army, I came back to live here 14 years ago. I work for the University of Texas at El Paso where I'm the director for the Center for Environmental Resource Management. Bob and Jesus share a similar experience as members of the Joint Advisory Committee for Air Quality in the Paso del Norte Airshed. 
This committee of 10 from the U.S. and 10 from Mexico are credited with helping El Paso hit the air quality goals set by the EPA. What is the Joint Advisory Committee? Well, first, you need to know what the La Paz Agreement is. The La Paz Agreement was signed by the United States and Mexico in 1983. The La Paz Agreement recognizes the importance of a healthful environment to the long-term economic and social well-being of present and future generations of each country and as well as of the global community. So basically, it's an agreement on cooperation for the protection and improvement of the environment around the border area with a heavy emphasis on air quality. The Joint Advisory Committee is a result of the La Paz Agreement. And they began to realize that the way to control the air quality in the area was to have one, one agency doing it. And they, they literally wanted to push for what I would call an international air quality management district. Uh, that's a hard animal to create. Issues of sovereignty, not only federal sovereignty, but state, states' rights, community rights. Uh, to me, it's, it's pretty clear that an organization like that would make a lot of lawyers very rich. It's the absurdity of drawing a, using a political boundary to try to enforce environmental conditions. That we share health problems, we share economic problems, and definitely we share the air that we breathe. Especially in El Paso, we couldn't solve the air quality problems by ourselves, and we needed to do it together with the Mexicans, because as you can see back there, you can't see the border. You, you, it's, it's hard to tell where it is. I mean, I could point it out to you, but if you're not a native, you don't, you, from this point, you can't see where the border is. And pollution doesn't stop at the borders. The Joint Advisory Committee represents what people and on a larger scale governments can do when they work together. So great job El Paso and Juarez for lowering the level of carbon monoxide, ozone and particulate matter in the Paso del Norte airshed. The majority of environmental initiatives in this area are funded by the United States. And clearly, one of the richest countries in the world will be more successful at having greater participation with people changing their destructive habits. In the El Paso community, because we were non-attainment for carbon monoxide, in the wintertime, we oxygenate our fuels, we add oxygen, we do it with ethanol uh, to make the, uh, the fuel combustion a little cleaner. And we discovered that the Mexicans weren't doing that. So the committee wrote to the Mexican government, which then wrote to uh, Pemex, the Mexican uh, petroleum industry, and th through the committee's actions had oxygenated fuel introduced into Ciudad Juarez. Uh, not as quite as, as, as uh, at the same level that we would like it to have, but it was a start. It showed that the Mexicans were doing something uh, because the committee asked them to. The committee suggested they should. It took 42 years of hard work to make it to the point where the Environmental Protection Agency recognized the quality of air as meeting the standard safe zone for particulates. But why does the USA set standards for air quality in the first place? The US government has environmental standards for air quality for two reasons. The primary standard is a health-based standard. We set limits on the amount of particulate matter that could be in the air. We set limits on the levels of ozone that could be in the air. Uh, nitrogen dioxide, carbon monoxide, lead, sulfur dioxide. And those are all based on known health effects of those pollutants. There is a secondary standard for the protection of the environment or ec ecological standard, but the primary one is, is health care based. Uh, the supposition is that anytime you can have a lower level of an air pollutant, you're doing something to improve the air quality. So typically we do one of two things with, with, when we consider air quality and health. We either reduce emissions, lower the levels of these standards, or reduce exposures. How do you reduce exposures? You tell people who are in susceptible populations, uh, old, older people, people with, uh, with cardiovascular problems, with uh, cardiopulmonary problems, young infants, young children, asthmatics, people who are susceptible to air quality. Uh, you tell them when the air quality is gonna be bad and let them then take action to minimize their risk. Don't go outside and play when the ozone's high. Ozone, 
Chemical expression is O3. The normal state for oxygen is O2. So there's an extra oxygen atom in, in, the, in the molecule. What is it? With more oxygen, it's more oxidative, meaning it burns more. Now, you're going to probably ask me, why am I talking about ozone as a problem? Aren't we supposed to have ozone? And don't confuse stratospheric ozone, the ozone layer, like the hole in the ozone layer problem we were worried about with, uh, over the South Pole, with tropospheric or low-level ozone. The EPA has a slogan that says, ozone, good on high, bad nearby. Ground-level ozone can harm public health. You know, when Mike first called me, he wanted to talk about industrial air pollution, and I said, I, I, I use the mantra that almost everybody uses here when we talk about air quality, it's the vehicles. It's everybody's personal vehicle. And we're out here in the far west Texas. It's a great distance from any the next place down the road. Uh, you can see behind me the city is sprawling out. The county is 1,100 square miles. Uh, and we sprawl out. We don't build up. We build out. And everybody thinks it's their God-given right to drive their SUV to work. And then at lunchtime, to drive it through the drive through lane, grab a burger, go run a half a dozen errands, and come back, uh, come back to work at 1 o'clock. Very little carpooling. Uh, very little public transportation to make use of. So everybody's out here saying it's my God-given right to big, drive a big vehicle. Well, we've got to accept the responsibility that it's all of us that are contributing to the air quality problem. It's not as much that 800-foot smokestack that everybody points over there to the, at the Asarco smelter, but the probably 8 million feet of tailpipe in our driveways. There are at least 900,000 vehicles in this community. We have to lower our vehicle miles traveled per person. In order to get people off, off their vehicles, uh, there has to be an alternative. Uh, bicycles are definitely an alternative. Unfortunately, uh, we just don't have uh, the infrastructure to allow uh, bicycles on, on most of the streets. Uh, the new areas are implementing uh, some bike paths. Uh, there are moves uh, by city uh, council to to get people out and, and ride their bikes. But on a day-to-day -day basis, it, it's going to be very limited uh, as, as how many times or how many places you can use your bicycles. And then, unfortunately, there, there will be those days in which the pollution uh, is forecasted or will be high and it will it will not be healthy uh, to be riding a bicycle in in uh, traffic during our ozone season which is probably uh, April to October the state will issue advisories uh, the day before when they predict that ozone levels could get higher called ozone action day there's nothing compulsory about an ozone action day but if we can expand and people get the message, things will happen that, that people won't do some things on an ozone action day. They won't drive alone, they'll car, carpool, or they'll use whatever public transportation they can. They won't drive through drive through lanes in the morning. They won't gas up in the morning because those fugitive emissions from gassing their vehicles uh, contribute to the ozone problem. We won't mow our lawns with gas mowers in the morning because the emissions from those engines contribute to the ozone problem. So there's a lot of voluntary things you can do during an ozone action day that if people in large numbers did them can improve our situation. Uh, El Paso is, is very laid back and uh, this is one of those areas where we we show that we are we care to a certain extent but let somebody else do it. Unfortunately there isn't a great response because everybody says, well, I've got to do what I've got to do, and I want to do what I want to do. And so it's just one more gum wrapper on the, on the, uh, on the street. You know, it, it's like litter. It's like the sidewalk right in front of you. Uh, it's one more piece of discarded chewing gum on the sidewalk. Well, I'm not the big problem. I'm just a little part of the problem. And we have to all recognize that we're all contributing to it.
Riding away from El Paso, all I could think was that in a way, because all of us are gas burning consumers, we're all guilty of pulling the trigger that make air bad for breathing. In the small Texas town of Sierra Blanca, they know all about neighbors crapping on them. Literally. Rewind to the 1990s, Bill Clinton has prohibited dumping toxic waste in the ocean. The unintended consequences of this good action was that the toxic waste had to go somewhere. This meant that states could now transport toxic waste from one state to another. Nearly 2,100 miles away on the island of Manhattan, <laughs> a train carrying toxic poop left on a journey to deliver its cargo into the backyards of the residents of Sierra Blanca. They called it <laughs> the poo-poo choo-choo. That's right. The toxic sludge from Manhattan was boxed up, put on a freight cars, and delivered to Sierra Blanca, Texas. We had one group that wanted nothing to do with it, and and the what they went on was the assumption that it was toxic and that it was going to spread diseases. And everyone that pays the water bill in New York City paid for this sludge to be pushed on us and paid for the mafia to take it off their hands and dump it on this small community. One group that wanted it to come because it produced jobs here in, in Hudson County, we're a poor county and we don't have many jobs and, and a lot of the times, you know, something that's less desirable, when that comes in, it supplies jobs for people, a way to make a living. So there was quite a few people that worked out there and that did support the project. 250 tons per day per day, not per week, but every day, to up to 400 tons. The first shipments were in July of 1992. The last shipment was, was, is, was in July of 2001. What's in the sludge? Well, everything that goes down the sewer ends up in the sewage system that ends up in sewage sludge. What you have there is a toxic soup of industrial uh, waste that's mixed in with some residential waste. The sludge cannot be legally spread in New York State because their law said that it had to comply with certain amounts of lead and copper and PCBs and yet they gave them a waiver because they were just sending it to Texas to dump over here where, where uh, our state regulatory agency said it might be all, it would be all right. Uh, I had mentioned earlier about the smell and that was a problem. The, when it was spread out there, the, when it would rain and the wind was blowing a certain direction, the smell would come into the town and it was bad. It was not here all the time, but it, when it came, it was not good. Then the sewage sludge gets spread out in Sierra Blanca uh, on rangeland, uh, not in a hole, but just spread over thousands of acres where it can be blown into the, into the air. It's real hard to prove causation of uh, sickness. It's a legal thing that they, you know, you could die of. Uh, cancer, and you know you was caused by smoking t cigarettes, but you're not going to be able to, in a court of law, prove that you died because of your smoking cigarettes. Everyone knows it, but it, proving causation is a legal thing that's very hard. But we know here, we saw a lot of flu that, the, and gastrointestinal illnesses. That, and that's exactly right. You can't trace it. We don't know. That we've had people here with cancer. We've had people with respiratory problems. We had people here with cancer and respiratory problems before the sludge came in. Uh, of course, we've had that since the sludge is gone, but the sludge is not gone. That's the thing. It's still here. A border patrol who live here would say their wives would come in our general store. We have a general store downtown, Garen Company. It's now closed and then say, gosh, Gloria, to my mom, my family was never sick when we came from Del Rio or wherever. Now my family and my husband, they're always sick. You know, it's, it's that, it must be that. that was, so there's a lot of talk about that. The doctors in, in uh, Van Horn, our closest hospital is 34 miles away. They said, even at Van Horn in here, that they found a strain of flu, of New York City flu, that they never saw here before. And that it was emptying out the school of uh, 40, 50 kids at a time, and here 50 kids is a lot of kids in a small town, you know. So, you know, I, I can't say, you can't, you cannot say that that's what the disease is. I, I don't believe there were that many, many more diseases after the sludge was spread there than there was after, before, but, you know, I'm, I haven't seen any studies on that. And the sludge project did exist for eight years, and mercifully in 2001 it was stopped when they lost their contract.
Sierra Blanca is still recovering from the massive dump that New York City unloaded on them in the 1990s. This story forced me to think about the mountain of crap that I've built in my life. The unintended consequences of seemingly harmless actions having negative effects on my neighbors. And I couldn't help but wonder if the people of Sierra Blanca ever said on really stinky, really smelly days when that poop smell would come into town, that crap smells like greed, if you ask me. Mike and I are almost at the halfway point on this cross-country bicycle ride through the southern tier of the United States, just outside of Van Horn, Texas. And we still want to know where we're at in a world of environmental change and challenge. And right now I'm asking you to think about your actions as a consumer and how those actions could be affecting the health and well-being, not only of generations living today, but the future generations stuck cleaning up the mess that we make during our lives.